Strawberry Switchblade is one of my favorite groups of all time, as you can tell by the poster in the back. I absolutely love their aesthetic and new wave synth pop sound. However, the group was very short lived, which led me to the question of whatever happened to Strawberry Switchblade? So today we're going to look at the history of the group, the discography of the group, and most importantly, why they broke up and what do they do after they broke up. And by the way, this will be a new series, so I might make videos like this on other bands, so stay tuned for that. So anyway, Let's start off with the history of Strawberry Switchblade. Strawberry Switchblade formed in 1981 in Glasgow, Scotland. The group consisted of Rose McDowell on lead vocals and rhythm guitar, Jill Bryson on backup vocals and lead guitar, Janice Goodlett on bass, and Carol McGowan on drums. Rose McDowell was formerly of an unsuccessful punk band that was called The Poems, which was, uh, very different than Strawberry Switchblade. <laughs> Jill Bryson was a graduate from the Glasgow School of Arts with a degree in mixed media, and Janice Goodlett and Carol McGowan were close friends of the two. The four recorded a demo in 1982. The demo consisted of three songs, and wow, it's pretty good. Let's look at the song Trees and Flowers, which is just spectacular. <laughs> And wait, let's read into these lyrics. For I hate the trees, and I hate the flowers, and I hate the buildings, and the way they tower over me. Can't you see? I get so frightened. No one else seems frightened. Only me. Only me. Yes, this song is about agoraphobia, which is the fear of places or situations that might cause panic. This condition can cause multiple panic attacks and overwhelmment. It can stop you from doing things such as like getting on an airplane. And Jill Bryson had agoraphobia and wrote this song about her experiences with it. And remember her agoraphobia, this will come important later on. They followed up recording the demo by playing a couple of gigs with moderate success, and even playing a John Peel gig on the BBC radio. However, after a few gigs, Janice Goodlett and Carol McGowan left the band. Now, why did they do this? Honestly, I couldn't find much reasoning on why exactly they left, but from what I found, it's that like they just didn't feel like a big connection with the other two. And after they left, Janice Goodlett left and became a teacher and later got married and now goes by Janice Vanderflyer and is still a school teacher in Glasgow. And for Carol McGowan, she left to become a marine biologist and I could find nothing else about them besides the fact that they died. So rest in peace. After they left the group, it was just Jill Bryson and Rose McDowell. Together, in 1983, they decided to re-record Trees and Flowers with more of an electric and new wave sound. This song was produced by Bill Drummerd, who made songs for other new wave groups at the time, such as Sukshi and the Banshees and Echo and the Bunnymen. And actually, fun fact, on this song, the person playing guitar is Roddy Frame of Aztec Camera. And I just want to say I love Aztec Camera. I might make a video on them. But anyway, this song was like when they started to shift towards a more electronic sound. And they received moderate success with this selling over 10,000 copies. After this, they kept on writing, and in 1984, they dropped their best and most successful song, Since Yesterday. It was an absolute success and reached number 5 on the UK charts. And this song is just such a banger, I absolutely adore it. And also the B-side features a very nice cover of the Velvet Underground Sunday Morning and an extended version of Since Yesterday which has like a saxophone on it which is like the most 80s thing in the world. But now, after this, they decided they wanted to work on their first album. Strawberry Switchblade made their debut album in around 6-7 to seven weeks and released it on April 5th, 1985. The album had moderate success, but wow, the album is just amazing. Honestly, one of my favorite albums of all time. 
Songs on here, like Who Knows What Love Is, is just amazing. I absolutely adore this song, and the saxophone on this song too, ooh. Their voices are also absolutely beautiful, and after this they toured for a bit and they even had a young Bjork as an opener for them as a part of their band Kukul. And oh my gosh, look at their outfits. One of the key defining traits of the group was their unique sense of style, ribbons and polka dots, and it's just amazing, I adore it. Their style can be categorized as Gothic Lolita, which was a very popular style in Japan during the time. Which leads them to, despite being a British band, they started to receive a lot of success over in Japan. The two of them described the success as being odd, but they enjoyed having success, obviously. This led to them releasing a single in Japan that was used for a Subaru commercial called Ecstasy Apple of My Eye. And I just want to say, besides this song being great, it is probably the most Japanese sounding English song ever. Have a listen. However, despite me obviously liking the song a lot, the band didn't like it that much. Rose McDowell even sang in an interview. It was a nightmare that period. We did another stupid jingle for Shockwave's Hairspray, and that was fucking atrocious as well. With Ecstasy, they actually sent us the lyrics and asked us to write the music for it. I said, I'm not singing those lyrics. So I rewrote the lyrics, which were just silly, but whatever. We made just a few bad mistakes at the end of our career, basically. After this, they published a cover of Jolene by Dolly Parton. By the way, an amazing cover that received pretty good success in the UK and Japan. Strawberry Switchblade at this time seems like all they could do is get more popular. So what did they do after this? Well, this is when the group starts to fall apart. Complications between Jill and Rose started to arise when they just didn't work as well together. Stress also started to build up in both of them after they became famous. Rose said in an interview, A lot of it was because I really felt really pressured. I mean, I'd come home at the end of the day, and out of pure exhaustion of arguing a point with the record company, I'd just burst into tears. I was so frustrated and angry because I always made sure we had group meetings every Friday, and made sure we talked about whatever we thought was the right thing to do. And Jill and I would sit down and agree on everything and we'd agree to have to tell Rob Dickens and we'd tell the record company what we don't want to do. But then we'd get in there and Jill would be too shy to say it. And she'd also be too shy to say, I agree with Rose, even though we said it at home. So I felt like I was bashing my head off at a brick wall all the time. Because I was like the baddie going no, 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 looking from back up and it wasn't there. Jill would have probably just gone with it rather than face the conflict, however. And speaking of Jill not wanting to do things, remember when I said to remember the lyrics to Trees and Flowers about her agoraphobia? Yep, her agoraphobia played a big role in them breaking up. It caused a lot of issues between Jill and Rose. Jill sang in an interview when asked how Rose felt about her agoraphobia. She said, Rose thought it was a pain. She never said much, but it was clear it wasn't going to stop her. Her agoraphobia stopped her from traveling and even from getting on a plane when they were going to go to Japan to record their second album with Ryuchi Sakamoto of Yellow Magic Orchestra fame. Rose said in an interview about this, But Jill couldn't go to Japan and stay there, so that was a hindrance. We couldn't play New York, we couldn't play Hong Kong, because we had gigs in places like that. You are supposed to go to New York on bloody Concord and come back on the QE too. And I was like, oh wow, that'd be so fantastic. But Jill would say, I can't go. 
Also, Jill started to have problems with Rose as a person because of... Nazism? Yeah, according to Jill in an interview, she started wearing black rubber. I remember them spending a huge amount of money buying a Nazi youth dagger. Her and her husband. And it's like, why? What's that all about? However, when asked in an interview on why she owned a Nazi youth dagger, Rose justified it by saying, No, because that's only army memorabilia. Do you know what I mean? At first, I thought, has this been used? I did think that, because the one I got had this nick on the end. But a lot of those were never used. They were for Boy Scouts. And they were the exact same as the Boy Scouts dagger, except for the emblem. So really, it didn't have any significance in a Nazi way. There's no way that I'm a fascist or a Nazi. I think Hitler was a very interesting man, but he was totally off his fucking rocker. It's fascinating to think that he could control a whole nation like that. How the hell did he do it? Now, I don't think Rose McDowell was a Nazi, but she could have handled this situation a way lot better. Because this apology of sorts just wasn't that good, especially at the end where she's like, How did he control a whole nation like that? Just makes her sound kind of clueless and doesn't really help her case. Still, this really did upset Jill Bryson, and all of this turmoil led up to them releasing one last single in Japan in 1986 before the two broke up. Now, where did they go from here? Well, let's start with Rose McDowell. Immediately following the breakup, McDowell actually kind of tried to keep the band going on. She did a few shows with other people playing Strawberry Switchblade songs. Rose tells the story of the first show she did after the breakup. I took this acid, I went out on stage, and I swear, I don't know how I remembered the songs. I think it was because of the moon. Because I looked at the back of the hall and there was a spotlight, and I was thinking, wow, cool, the moon's come to my gig. What an honor. Because I was so elated about the moon being there, I wasn't thinking about the songs. I just played them naturally. It got reviewed as being the best pop band ever. So clearly, Rose McDowell was having a pretty good time trying to keep the band going on with other people. But how did Jill Bryson feel about this? Well, in an interview she said, I had asked her not to, but it was that kind of final thing. Well, you got nothing to do with it, this is my band! She used to do a lot of shouting, in studios especially. She would be, it's my band, it's my band, I'll do what I want, and people would really be taken aback. She'd get to a point where she felt that I was doing something that she liked, that she wanted to do. She'd build up like a pressure cooker and just explode. So clearly, Jill Bryson did not like that Rose McDowell was continuing on the band. But after a while, Rose McDowell will stop trying to keep the band going on by herself and just ended it. For the next couple of years, she actually stayed in the music scene, doing backup vocals for some groups like Current 93, and even in 1988 releasing a cover of Don't Fear the Reaper, which by the way is an absolutely amazing cover. She wasn't in anything permanent till 1993. That was when she made an album called Seasons in the Sun with Boyd Rice under the name Spell. And this album is pretty decent and features very similar vocals to the one she had on Strawberry Switchblade. But the band didn't go any further than that one release. Later that year, she formed the band Sorrow with her then-husband at the time. The group released two albums that are, in my opinion, actually pretty good, and they have this awesome synthy sound. And like always, her vocals are amazing. Please forgive me. Try to understand that I didn't mean to break and let me open up my lyric conspiracy brain for a moment. So let's look at the lyrics for the song Forgive Me by the band Sorrow. Will you please forgive me? Try to understand that I didn't mean to break your heart. Now it's me that's breaking, and my mind is taking my whole life apart. And in my opinion, I interpret this as Rose missing her friendship with Joe Bryson. Because the other option for this interpretation is that she's talking about like an old lover that like she wishes would forgive them. But this band was her and her husband, so that'd be like really weird if she was singing about that. 
So in my opinion, this has to be about Jill Bryson. Which now leads to the question, did Jill Bryson and Riz McDowell ever talk again after the breakup? And from what it seems like, no. Because any interview afterwards has no mention of them ever becoming friends again, and there are zero pictures of them together after they broke up. Despite this, they actually met each other one time in the mid-90s. According to an interview with Jill Bryson in 2001, she said that a few years prior that she and Rose met up because they got a royalties check that was in the name of the band, so they needed to split the money. When Jill met Rose, she is stated as saying, That's the only time I've seen her in a long time. It was weird because she was very, very friendly. She wanted to become friends. She was very open and very nice. However, like I said, they probably did not become friends because there were zero pictures of them together, and there are no interviews of them ever saying that they did become friends again. So, most likely, they didn't become friends again. But anyway, that group Sorrow continued until 2001, with Rose still doing backup vocals every now and then for other people's songs, and even making an extremely short-lived group called Rosa Mundi that released four songs, two of them being Christmas songs. And it sure is interesting, let's go with that. And hey, wait, remember when I said that Strawberry Switchblade was going to make a second album? Like with Ryuchi Sakamoto? Well, after they broke up, Rose actually spent some time working on it, but then never completed it. Until 2004, when she touched it up a bit and released it under the name Cut With The Cake Knife. And wow, this is great. As good as Strawberry Switchblade? No. But this album still has some amazing songs. Tibet is simply perfect. I adore it. The vocals on here are still amazing. If you like Strawberry Switchblade and you haven't listened to this entire album, I highly suggest you do because honestly, it's basically just more Strawberry Switchblade, so it's worth your time. After that release in 2004, she actually kind of laid low and didn't really do anything in the music scene. Till in 2015, she re-released Cut With The Cake Knife and recorded a new EP called Our Twisted Love. There are three songs on this EP and they're all fairly slower songs. They still sound like her, but you can tell that her voice is definitely aged. And in fact, after this, she actually started touring again. And I just want to say, I would love to be in this crowd. Even though her voice isn't the same anymore, I don't care. Just being in the same room as Rose McDowell would be a life-changing experience. And in fact, she actually still is touring. So, Rose McDowell, if you're watching this, come to South Florida, please. Anyway, the last piece of music she formally released was in 2019, when she helped make the soundtrack for the indie movie, Far From the Apple Tree, which I haven't seen, but the soundtrack is fairly ambient and you can still hear her unique voice on it, which I love. But yeah, besides just playing a few shows every now and then, she hasn't really done much in the past, like, five years. Which honestly, I respect it, she deserves the rest. But what about Jill Bryson? Well actually, Jill Bryson took a 30 year break from music after breaking up with Strawberry Switchblade. She spent her time making use of her mixed media degree she got. She started, during, she started doing work in stained glass, photo montages, tapestry, and of course she did painting. Some of her works definitely have the style of Strawberry Switchblade. And after her 30 year break in 2013, she went back into music under the group The Shapist with Craig Hood and Jesse Frost. They released 9 singles between 2013 and 2015, including a re-recording of Trees and Flowers. Honestly, her voice is still amazing and I like these soft little songs. Where do we go? Pretty good. She hasn't made any music since then, but she still continues to make art and she has even kept a bit of her style from Strawberry Switchblade going on. In conclusion, well, obviously I love Strawberry Switchblade, they also both had very good careers after they broke up. I love both of their musical outputs after they broke up from the band and they both seem like very nice people just living, you know, normal people lives like being married, having kids, something I won't have to worry about since I'm 16. Which leads me to another question that some people might be asking, because I noticed that a lot of my viewers are kind of older. So, you might be asking, why does a 16-year-old 
by, from Florida, by the way, Strawberry Switchblade did not have any success in America at all. So a 16 year old from Florida knowing about this like 80, like short lived eighties band, like that wasn't even that popular. Well, Strawberry Switchblade actually had a kind of like a resurgence on TikTok. Yes, I found them from TikTok. I'm sorry, don't hate me. The original demo for Trees and Flowers became very popular on the app, leading many people of my age to find about them. Not to mention that despite not actually being like goth, like they, although their aesthetic is kind of goth, their music definitely is not goth. A lot of people in the culture talk about them and listen to them a lot. So they're still being carried on and they've influenced many artists such as Rose Garden Funeral Party, MGMT, and others. I love Strawberry Switchblade, one of my favorite groups of all time. Listen to their only album if you haven't already. If you like this video, please subscribe. It would mean a lot. And also in the comments, share your thoughts on the video and ask me like, give me like bands that I can make like a video like this on too. So if you have like an idea for that, you know, hit me up down there. Be like, hey, you should make a video on this group. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, I'll try to respond to all of them. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for watching this. This has been my longest video yet. <laughs> so thank you for getting all the way through it. Thank you. Anyway. Lucky Star fan, out. And as we sit here alone, looking for a reason to go on, it's so clear that all we have now are thoughts of yesterday.